Here is a depiction of St. Josephine Bakita. Uh, she was, well, I'll say more about her life in a moment here. To say a little bit more about her background, well, the one thing I do need to mention is that she's from Sudan, uh, which is an African country. Um, and so I want to back up and say a little bit more about the history of Christianity in Africa. Uh, really, in a sense, we could trace the history of Christianity in Africa all the way back to the moment of uh, Jesus' uh, flight into Egypt during his infancy. In a sense, we could say that Christianity in Egypt or in Africa is as old as Jesus' own journey there. Uh, but in uh, the Mediterranean basin, certainly in the 4th century, Christianity had a, a good presence. And we see it spe especially in the forms of Christian monasticism that arose in Egypt uh, by the 4th century. This would be sort of an ancient Egyptian monastery, so to speak, or hermitage, perhaps, more likely. Uh, there are a number of important early Christian saints that come from North Africa. We have Augustine of Hippo, who transferred, well, let's see, is Hippo in, no, anyway, yeah, I think Hippo's in North Africa, sorry, I'm <laughs> blanking now. But um, he, he was from North Africa, at least. Um, and this leads also to a variety of depictions of this saint. So here we have a, a relatively European portrayal, right, that you'll see. But maybe if we're thinking more historically, right, we might think of uh, Augustine of Hippos looking something more like this. Uh, the history of this de depiction is a fascinating topic, which would be a whole other presentation. Nevertheless, uh, in a couple centuries after the life of uh, St. Augustine, he lived into the 5th century, um, we see the rise of Islam after the year 632. And so this is the Christian, the Byzantine Empire there, right, in purple around the Mediterranean Basin in 632. And green is the uh, Islamic Empire, uh, well, starting to be the Islamic Empire starting around 632 with the death of Muhammad. Within the next hundred years, look at, you're going to see here the expansion of the Muslim Empire, right, all the way across northern Africa and entirely capturing most, like, Spain there, right? I mean, it was an incredibly quick expansion of the Muslim empires in, in that period. And this was an existential threat to Christianity at the time, right? I mean, this f f very fast invasion of Europe is underway. And uh, in 732, right there at the n northern end of the green and the southern end of the red there in Spain, right, we have this uh, battle where the Frankish armies finally repelled the advancing Islamic armies. Um coming from Spain, and that was sort of the moment that stopped at least the invasion any further into Europe. Um, now, you know, we could talk about these religious conflicts in more depth, but what I really want to focus on is the way in which these conflicts came to sort of shape the way that um, Christians came to think about Africa in the centuries to come. Um, on the one hand, we can also even before I say anything about this Islam stuff, we can say that even before the rise of Islam, there were conflicts between different regions of Africa, between Egyptians and Ethiopians. So the Egyptians tended to have negative stereotypes about darker-skinned Ethiopian people um, and associated them with various evils, like even depicting demons as Ethiopian, dark-skinned Ethiopians, in a lot of their ancient monastic literature. Um, but in the period of Islam, uh, we have a couple of things that are worth mentioning here, right? We see these sort, this sort of cluster of associations. I'm going to point away from Islam directly, even though they're, Islam is the origin of these things in some ways, right? The associations are weird. They're ge geographic and then they're also around skin tone, right? I mean, things that don't necessarily make any sense. But I promise it's a real association. Christians came to describe this cluster of things as the curse of Ham. The curse of Ham is a reference to a book, uh, a verse from the book of Genesis, which reads, Cursed be Canaan, one of son, uh, Ham's sons. Lowest of slaves shall he be to his brothers the slave of his brothers, right? I mean, this is an odd claim, but it was interpreted by Christians after the rise of Islam 
as a way to make sense of a number of these associations that I have encir encircled there. On the one hand, Canaan was then understood, even though the text doesn't say it, Canaan was understood to have had dark skin and to be the one then who was cursed because of it. It's a bizarre association. It's but it's real, it's historical. I can, there's plenty of books out there about it. Uh, Christians thought this stuff. Um, dark skin then was also associated with Satan and thereby with vicious acti uh, and vicious behaviors uh, like violence and hypersexuality. Um, and then in turn, this thing about slavery was associated with it because Canaan is now supposed to be the slave of his brothers the slavery in turn was an, interpreted as a divinely sanctioned cure for the curse that was put on Canaan. <laughs> There's a lot to say about all of that that I'm not going to say right now. But nevertheless, this is some of the historical roots of the reasons why Africans came to be the ones who were enslaved. So, moving on to Josephine herself. She, right, like I said, she's from Sudan. You can see it in the middle of the map there. Uh, from the Darfur region there, in the uh, western f portion of modern Sudan. Um, she was born in 1869, and she herself was enslaved in, uh, well, maybe, I think, yeah, starting in her original area, from the ages of 7 to 12. She was held alternately by Turkish Muslims and by some Italian Christians. Um, she was not physically abused by her Italian owners, but they did hold her in bondage and when they transferred her to Italy, even though Italian law did not have any space for uh, a legal status for slavery. Um, so she stayed with a group of sisters called the Canosian Sisters in 1888, and they introduced her to Christianity. Um, she saw a crucifix, which was an instrument of torture even in her own country, right? And she asked about the meaning of this man that they had hanging on an instrument of torture. And they said, well, he did that for you. <laughs> and she was struck by this willingness of Christ to suffer on behalf of her and uh, on behalf of her people and felt a call to conversion. So when uh, her owners attempted to try to force her to return to Sudan, uh, she refused to go and set in motion a legal process that eventually led to her liberation. There's a lot to say there, but uh, I'm going to have to keep moving for the moment. <laughs> she remained with the Canosians and received the sacraments in 1890 um, and entered the novitiate with the Canosians. Oh, yeah, I just, uh, yeah and, and took her vows in 1896. She often spoke of her experiences as a slave uh, and of African society and African culture uh, in order to prepare her fellow sisters for missionary activities in that area. Um, she served in her community until her death in 1947, and again, part of her Marian devotion is found in her very last words, which were, Our Lady, Our Lady, she died on a Saturday, which was uh, then understood as the Day of Mary. So, what can we draw from Josephine's life? Well, maybe I'll keep it this one brief and simple. We all encounter obstacles to our faith. Josephine certainly encountered obstacles in her life, even at the hands of Christians. Um, but just as she looked up to the cross and saw Christ as inspiration and strength, so we too can find inspiration and strength and guidance when we turn to look at Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. In uh, the depiction of uh, Josephine, that our artist Aaron Wee has prepared, you'll see a couple of symbols. Uh, first is a, a medal around her neck. That's a depiction of Our Lady of Sorrows. This is a, a reference again to uh, Josephine's enslavement in her early years, but also then her solidarity and her imitation of Mary's sorrows, right? Her quiet suffering on behalf of uh, and for those around her. Um, just uh, Mary and uh, Mary and Josephine together shared many unjust sufferings in their lives. The second, then, uh, is a reference both to her spiritual and her physical liberation 
in her own lifetime, um, we see uh, these shackles, right? Uh, that she she undertook an effort to to gain her uh, legal freedom in Italy, but then in Christianity she also found her true spiritual freedom. There are some books about Josephine that you can go find, but I'm just going to point to one example for you here. Uh, that uh, it's by Ignatius. That, that's a Catholic press, and I, I suspect that that would be a good place to start in further uh, sort of searching out of another one of our saints of the tradition. <laughs>